Before we start, how many people came over the bridge? <laughs> oh, a few. Okay. All right. Well, welcome. Uh, this is our October edition of our 2014 Celebrate Oakmont Speaker Series. Topic tonight is the Halton Bridge. Cities and towns are often identified by the bridges in their communities. New York City is home to the Brooklyn Bridge. San Francisco is known for the Golden Gate Bridge. And the Tower Bridge is a landmark in London. Although Oakmont is a small town, much smaller than most of those cities, for the past 105 years, it has been recognized as the home of the Halton Bridge. The bridge was named for Jonathan Halton. Uh, Jonathan Halton was one of the early settlers here in Oakmont, and he owned the land down by the river um, where the bridge stands today. I, I, I'd like to introduce, just say hello to uh, Keith Halton sitting over there, who is a direct descendant of Jonathan Halton. So we still have uh, old Jonathan's family still live in the area. In 1853, the Allegheny Valley Railroad uh, built a train station on Jonathan Halton's property. That was located right at the Halton Crossing at the boulevard. And that was the first train station along the line. As a result, people who lived on the other side of the river wanted to come over to the train. A lot of times if they had to go to Pittsburgh, they would want to come over here and ride the train, but there was no bridge. So Mr. Halton began to operate a ferry from his home. And this is a picture of the original Halton house. This was located at the foot of Halton Road where the bridge now stands. This here picture is um, a ferry that was operated at the site by the Bain family. Now Mr. Halton operated his uh, ferry from the Oakmont side and the Bain family operated theirs from the Harmerville side. But they were at the same location. And if you look at this picture, you can see in the background, that's Oakmont over there, the flats of Oakmont, lower Oakmont. And then you can see the uh, hillside over there coming down route where it is now Route 28. But this picture was taken right where the bridge crosses the river today. In 1908, when Allegheny County um, decided to build a new bridge, they chose that location at the Halton Crossing because by that time it had become a very busy ferry uh, crossing there. So they decided that they would build a bridge there. And on August 11th, 1908, they put out a bid proposal in the Pittsburgh Press. And they asked for a bid on the construction of what they called Bridge Number One on the Allegheny River near Halton Station. Now, as I said, this went out on August 11th, 1908. The bids were due just two weeks later, August 26th, when they were opened, and the bridge construction began September 8th. So, in less than a month, they took the bids, looked them over. They awarded the contract to the American Bridge Company. And they were to supply 2,400 tons of steel for the superstructure. The Friday Construction Company was awarded the bid to construct the abutment and the piers for the bridge. The total cost of the new bridge? $306,000, including labor, materials, construction. Now, $306,000 today will buy you a medium-sized house in Oakmont. 105 years ago, you could have bought the Halton Bridge for that, that money. This bridge was the first major bridge that was constructed by Allegheny County. And it was meant to be a free public access bridge. Because you see, back then, a lot of the bridges around the Pittsburgh area were toll bridges. And they were owned by private companies. So if you wanted to use their bridge, you had to pay a toll. A, a group of people in Verona formed the Verona Bridge Company. 
and their plans were to build a bridge from Verona over to O'Hara Township and it would go across the river at Grant Street, if you know where Grant Street is in Verona. However, they weren't able to obtain the investors, so they never did build that bridge. My father-in-law told the story. He grew up on Heron Hill, which is above the, the strip district there in Pittsburgh. And this was back in the uh, late teens, early 1920s. Well, his father had a cow that he raised in the backyard. And when it came time to butcher the cow, he and his father took it down the hill over to Hare's Island. The problem was when they went to cross the bridge to get to Hare's Island, they didn't have 25 cents toll for the cow. So my father-in-law had to run the whole way back up the hill, get a quarter so they could come back down and take the cow across the bridge. So uh, back then it was very common for a lot of these bridges in Pittsburgh to be uh, toll bridges. The Halton Bridge is a five-span through truss structure. It was designed by J.G. Chalfont, an Allegheny County engineer. The bridge deck is 1,544 feet in length and the deck is 50 feet above the water level. Now it's very interesting how they built this bridge. Uh, today we have the benefit of all the heavy equipment, the cranes, the diesel powered equipment. Back then they didn't have any of that. So this bridge was literally built by hand. And what they did was, you can see this structure here. The bridge is what they called um, a pin connected bridge. And if you've ever driven across it, you've seen the beams that across there, and then there's those X's that, that hold it together. Well, with the construction of that bridge, it was so heavy that it couldn't support itself while it was under construction because all those beams would have collapsed. So what they had to do is they built these huge trusses or derricks and they suspended the superstructure in there and built it. And they almost, it was like they hung it in there build it, and then when it was completed, locked together, that's when it obtained its strength and was able to hold the weight. And you can see in this picture, this is the last uh, span which connects onto Route 28. If you look over, you can see that span is, is completed, and it's standing, and it's, it's ready to go, it's locked together, and it's um, you know, able to bear the weight, so it's sitting on the piers. Once they would start here and start working over, as I said, they would hang that in there. They did it all with pulleys and winches, cantilevers. All those steel beams is how they put them in place. And then they riveted them, and then some of them were tightened with bolts. What's interesting is, I found this sketch in an old report. This shows the bridge piers, and this shows you how much thought they planning they gave when they put the bridge up. And, and this is what Friday Construction had done. If you notice the two piers in the main channel, they're on an angle. The reason for that is the bridge is built on a, a river bend. And so they put those two piers on an angle to accommodate the river flow and cut down on the resistance of the river flowing by. And then as you can see, the other piers on each end and in the island channel are perpendicular to the deck. So if you ever go down there and you're able to you know, get a good view from the park, you'll notice that those two bridge piers are on a slight angle and that's the reason that they're like that. On June 10th, 1909, Victor Friday, who was the owner of Friday Construction Company, was inspecting one of the piers. Beams fell and struck him on the head and he was killed instantly. Mr. Friday was the only fatality in the construction of the bridge. Now his company had a, a fine reputation for building bridges here in Pittsburgh. They built the Charleroi Bridge on the Monongahela River and if you've ever been down that way, that bridge was replaced I think in 2005 and it was very similar to the, to the Halton Bridge. They also did work on the Smithfield Street Bridge and um, if you've ever been on Washington Avenue, the Larimer Avenue Bridge which crosses over uh, Washington Avenue, the company worked on that. Um, I'm, I'm excited because I'd like to introduce two gentlemen here who are the grandsons of Victor Friday. Um, Vic Friday III and his cousin Joe Lawson. 
Joe and Vic, if you stand up and say hello to everybody. I have to say, you know, uh, uh, that would have to be a great feeling every time you cross that bridge knowing that your grandfather uh, helped build that bridge. But they're very close to the bridge. Joe lives over in Springdale and Vic lives here in Oakmont. So uh, it's, it's good to have an attachment to that bridge that we can all, you know, say we met the family of the people who built that bridge. The original bridge deck consisted of wooden blocks with the rough cut side up. The reason for this was when the horse and wagons would go across, the rough cut wood would provide traction for the horses to pull the wagon across. The sidewalk on, on the side was originally made of wooden planks and the original plans called for streetcar tracks to go across the bridge. And their plans were they would connect the Wilkinsburg Oakmont uh, streetcar over into Harmerville and then they would be able to service that side of the river. However, they couldn't make an agreement with the streetcar company, so they never installed uh, streetcar tracks. As I said, they began construction on September 8, 1908. The bridge was completed in just 14 months. It opened ahead of schedule in early November of 1909. And they had originally projected it to be open in the sp uh, spring of, of 1910, but they finished it up early. And I, I don't know, that just amazes me that, you know, they built that bridge by hand and they only built it in 14 months. You know, and if you've ever been sitting in traffic and just take the time to look at that bridge and all the construction that went into it. When the bridge was designed by Mr. Chalfont, the main mode of, of transportation was horse and wagon. This picture of Reed's lumber wagon uh, from Oakmont, they had a lumber mill here, here in Oakmont at the time. If you stop and think about it, this wagon was probably the heaviest, one of the heavier vehicles to go across the bridge when it was first built. But what's amazing is, how could Mr. Chalfont even imagine, you know, what an 18-wheeler was, and the buses, and the trucks, and the cars. And, and I read PennDOT's estimate, and they said 25,000 cars a day crossed the bridge. I thought that was a little high, but that's what they claimed. So he designed this bridge, and for 105 years, it's been able to sustain all that weight and all that traffic. And he had no idea what a new car would be like or a truck. And that, I think that's a real testament to the men who built the bridge. One of the first motorists to cross the bridge was President William Howard Taft. During a visit to Pittsburgh on May 2nd, 1910, President Taft took an automo automobile tour out to Oakmont where he crossed the bridge and went down through the communities of Aspenwall and Sharpsburg. Uh, President Taft was a frequent visitor to Pittsburgh because his wife's sister was married to Thomas Lachlan of Jones and Lachlan fame. And so they would come to visit and every time he came to town he always liked to take automobile tours of the Pittsburgh area. And I, I just wondered if did he like to take tours or did he just want to get away from his in-laws? But he would always go for car rides. But this is a picture of President Taft and that is Mayor William McGee who was the mayor of Pittsburgh at the time. And they're in the back of a car going out to take a tour. Now I don't know if this is the day they came out to Halton Bridge but this is one of the rides that they took in an automobile. When the bridge was first completed it was the responsibility of the Oakmont Police Department to light the gas lights that illuminated it each night. They had to walk the beat, light the lights, and then first thing in the morning, they would go extinguish the gas lights. And that was one of the responsibilities that they had with taking care of the bridge. When it was originally built, at the Harmerville end, there was a set of steps that descended down to the trolley tracks that ran underneath it. This picture is of, it's, it's, it's not good quality, but you can see it says uh, Oddfellows Band of Verona, Pennsylvania. So we don't know what this was, but I have a feeling this may have been the opening ceremony for the bridge, because I don't know why else they would be over there 
under the bridge. But it just gives you an idea of the uh, steps and how you could cross the bridge and walk down to the train tracks. During World War II, the bridge was a target of possible sabotage. On December 22nd, 1941, just two weeks after Pearl Harbor was attacked, um, there were three men who were seen taking pictures of the Westinghouse Bridge and the Edgar Thompson Steelworks. Well, there were members of the Pennsylvania Reserve Defense Corps uh, came out after them, but they got away. Later in the day, they showed up at the Halton Bridge and they were taking pictures. And someone called the Oakmont Police. The Oakmont Police went down and apprehended them. Uh, when they searched their car, they found photographic material, they found undeveloped film, and they found photographs of factories and bridges uh, around the Pittsburgh area. So they called in the FBI. The FBI, J. Edgar Hoover sent his men, and never heard from them again. But um, what was interesting, after that incident, armed guards were posted at each end of the Halton Bridge during World War II, just to make sure that no one would try to sabotage it. There have been a number of uh, reported suicides from the bridge. Uh, the first was in the newspaper, uh, the Pittsburgh Press reported, it was in 1915, that a pretty young girl from New Kensington jumped to her death from the Halton Bridge. Over the years, there have been a number of people who have um, jumped off the Halton Bridge. However, it has not always been deaths that occurred on the Halton Bridge. Um, on March 18, 1986, a call came into the Verona Fire Department that a lady had unexpectedly gone into labor. And they were pa her family was passing through town, and they were in the parking lot of the Kogos, which is now the get-go uh, on, on the main street. Well, at the time, the Verona Fire Department had an ambulance, and they responded, and it was uh, Jim, Broderick, Jim Broderick, uh, Jim Lowheide and Keith Durkin and so they put the lady in the ambulance and they could see she didn't have much time and they sped off to St. Margaret's. The only problem was it was Friday afternoon and it was rush hour. <laughs> and they got about halfway across the bridge and little Rachel Louise Speck weighing five pounds, twelve ounces came into this world on the middle of the Halton Bridge. <laughs> On May 22nd, 1993, a call came into the Oakmont Police Station that someone had seen a man throw a baby off the bridge. So the police department quickly responded and they found a man uh, walking on the bridge. Uh, they approached him and they questioned him. They found out that he was returning from Laura Lane's over in Harmerville and he had a bad day at the bowling alley and he was so mad he threw his bowling ball off the bridge. So, <laughs> The bridge also attracted its share of daredevils. Thomas Hunter uh, owned Hunter Brothers store down in the corner of Halton Road and the Boulevard. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Well he had a son by the name of Kenneth and his nickname was Kelly. Kenneth liked to dive off the Halton Bridge. And um, his father used to get very mad at him whenever he did it. And every time he tried, somebody would come running up to the store and say, Kelly's going to jump off the bridge again. And old Tom would run down, but he was never able to stop him. And this is a picture of uh, Ken jumping off the bridge. And he's not jumping, he's diving. If you see the picture, I don't know if you can tell. But that's a picture that was taken. And then the other one is an article that appeared in the Pittsburgh Dispatch in 1915 of him diving off the bridge. You know, 50 feet. And 1915 was before we had the series of locks and dams. So the river wasn't as deep as it is today. But uh, he survived every one and uh, had a good time doing it. The bridge also attracted early airplane pilots. Back in the 1920s, uh, a lot of them liked to fly their airplanes underneath the bridge. There was a gentleman uh, who lived on Washington Avenue by the name of Bill Kennedy. And Bill was a pilot in World War I. 
Well, after the war, he came back and he was, I guess you could call him one of the barnstormers. He liked to fly his plane and do stunts and things like that. And he was known for not only flying under the bridge, but he would do a loop-de-loop -loop back down under again. And so people used to go down and, and watch uh, Bill fly under the bridge. Um, we did our oral histories a couple of years ago and we found a tape of a gentleman by the name of Don, Don McCandless. And uh, Don and his buddy uh, Nelson Verner used to go flying and Nelson was the pilot and Don would ride along with him. So he said one day they decided, Nelson decided he was going to fly under the bridge. And Don said that they were up 3,000 feet, however high they go, and he looked down at the bridge and it looked like the bridge was literally sitting on the water. And down they came. And you have to stop and think, a plane in a dive is traveling, I don't know, any pilots here, 140 miles per hour, 120 miles per hour, coming down and you have 50 feet between the bridge and the water. Too low, you're in the water. Too high, you're in the bridge. And he said they came down through there and made it under, no problem. Uh, another pilot that, that told me that he flew under the bridge one or two times is a gentleman by the name of Jim Eaton. Jim is a member of our historical society. Jim has been a pilot for 70 years. I think he's now 94, 97, yeah. Well, it just so happened that one day my great uncle happened to be down on the riverside and he also happened to have his camera with him. And he could see this plane making a descent coming down to fly under the bridge. So he snapped a picture and he said that it was Jim Eaton. Now, I don't know, I can't verify if in fact it was Jim, <laughs> but... <laughs> But, uh, but no, Jim, Jim is a good guy and he told me, he said, yeah, once or twice I flew under there. This is one of my favorite pictures of the bridge. This was taken from the Harmerville side up on the hill there and you see the Paddleworld steamboat uh, going underneath it. And also if you look in the corner here, you can see the steps are, are still there. So that was an early picture of the bridge. But if you could sum up the Halton Bridge in one word, I would say survivor. It is the second oldest bridge in the area, second only to the Smithfield Street Bridge. And through the years, it's always survived a number of attempts to be replaced. In 1956, the Pittsburgh Regional Planning Association recommended replacing the bridge. The group stated that the 50-year-old structure was outdated and needed to be replaced. However, no action was ever taken. In 1961, the state announced plans for a new Route 28 expressway, which would come up the valley. Part of the plans called for a bridge that would connect Oakmont right up onto the expressway. However, they didn't have the funding, so when they built the expressway, they eliminated the bridge, and the old Halton Bridge survived one more time. Ten years later, State Representative Joseph Benetto from Plum pushed for a new bridge to be built further upriver to replace the Halton Bridge. And it just happened to be in his hometown of Plum. <laughs> but again, no action was taken. In 1973, the Southwest, Plan Southwest Regional Planning Commission unveiled plans for a new beltway around Pittsburgh. And this beltway would connect to the Parkway East out in Penn Hills and follow that Rodi Road corridor up Rodi, cut across Penn Hills, and then down in the area around Shannon Road and cut across with a new bridge below Verona. But again, uh, those plans never materialized and the bridge survived one more time. The bridge also survived threats by Mother Nature. Floods, freezing, and wind often threaten the structure. On March 12, 1961, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette ran a feature on the 25th anniversary of the St. Patrick's Day flood of 1936. And I found a copy of that article. In that article, there was a gentleman by the name of Edward Jensen 
who was nine years old in 1936. And he recollected the day that the St. Patrick's Day flood hit. And he talked about the Halton Bridge. He said, we stood on the bridge and watched the debris and dead animals float by. The bridge shook so ominously under the pressure of the water, which rose to within feet of the roadbed, we expected it to collapse at any time. Several times we raced down to the bridge after hearing reports that it's going. I don't think we wanted it to collapse, but if it did, we wanted to be on hand when it went down. And this is a picture of the 1936 flood. This was taking on the Harmerville side upriver, looking down towards Oakmont. And you can see how high that water is by the piers, how high the river had come up. And I know that picture is sort of fuzzy, but if you look in the middle there, there's two things in the river. Those are both houses that are floating by there. That's what that is. But you know, I read that, and it brought back a childhood memory of mine. If you remember in 1972 when Hurricane Agnes blew through here and the river came up again, and we were young kids at the time, and the word went around Oakmont that the riverbed under one of the piers had washed away and the bridge was starting to lean. And I, I, I'll never forget, we got on our bikes and we rode down to the Riverside Park in the rain because we wanted to be there when the bridge went. And just like Mr. Jensen, we didn't want it to go, but we wanted to be there, but it withheld and it survived one more time. This is another picture from the 36 flood. You've probably seen this. This has uh, been around a lot. Um, this big tank coming down the river. But what's interesting, look up on the bridge, you see all those people standing up there. <laughs> I don't think they had any concern for safety back then, you know. <laughs> you wouldn't have caught me out there. But just think about that. What if that tank had come down a little further over to the middle and hit the pier? It could have taken out the bridge, but... It looks like there's a man standing on the railing. Yeah, I, I can't tell from my angle, but you can see... Yeah, there's a branch coming down there. But yeah, you can see the people lined up there watching the, uh, the, the floodwaters go by. By 1964, the condition of the bridge had deteriorated. Uh, it got so bad that they had to put a 12-ton weight limit on the bridge and truck traffic was restricted. They eventually had to close the bridge for major repairs and it was closed for a year. It reopened on December 1st, 1965 and the communities of Oakmont and Harmer celebrated the reopening of the bridge. They had a huge parade that started on the bridge and went through Oakmont down to Plum Street. Uh, the parade was led by the Oakmont High School Band. It included dignitaries from both communities. And uh, an Oakmont resident by the name of Robert Seeley drove his 1909 Buick in the parade. Uh, the Buick was made the same year that the bridge was built. Um, KDKA radio personality Johnny Costa served as the master of ceremonies. And he opened the bridge by breaking a bottle of champagne on the railing. Well, in February of 1989, Oakmont residents were alarmed when they found signs at the, each end of the bridge design, designating it as the Joseph Benetto Memorial Bridge. <laughs> Within 24 hours, those signs were gone, never to be seen again. The residents of Oakmont and Verona were outraged because the legislature had passed the name change without telling anyone. Mr. Bonetta had passed away, and so they decided to name the bridge in his honor. And if you remember, he was the guy that wanted to move the bridge up to Plum, but they, um, they named the bridge after him. Well, uh, a lady, Oakmont resident by the name of Elva Hayes, who was the great-great-granddaughter of Jonathan Halton, led a drive to have the name change, changed back. And uh, they had petitions and people write their representatives and it took five years, but finally uh, they did change the name back. And this is just an article that was in the Advanced Leader at the time. And at the bottom there's a survey that says, do you favor changing the name of the Joseph Benetto Bridge back to the original name of Halton Bridge? And so it was a huge controversy in town here. As I said, uh, the residents were able to get the name changed back. 
And uh, the legislature passed a bill naming it the Jonathan Halton Memorial Bridge. Uh, this is the certificate signed by, uh, well, it was Governor Single at the time. That's when Governor Casey was having his health problems. And this is the pen that he signed it with. And we have that at the History Center. So if you ever stop down there, we have that hanging on the wall. And you can see the, um, the pen that he used to change the name back. In 1991, the bridge gained national no notoriety uh, when PennDOT repainted the structure. The design supervisor of the project chose paint color number 2695. Well, people were surprised when they started to paint it that it was lilac. And quickly, all the news uh, papers and TV stations picked up on it and the story went national that Oakmont was home to a lilac covered bridge. <laughs> now this wasn't a goof. There was a real reason they did this. Uh, it enabled the bridge inspectors to spot any cracks that might develop in the steel. The light lilac would enable them to see the rust colored cracks. So it, it aided them in, uh, when they did a bridge inspection. In 2007, the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation announced that the Halton Bridge would finally be replaced. Construction of the new bridge was scheduled to begin in 2012 with a completion date of 2014. However, it was delayed and the actual work began in 2013 and is to be finished up in 2016. The new bridge will be a multi-girder steel structure. It will be 1,600 feet long, four 11 feet wide lanes, six foot shoulders on each side, a four foot median down the middle, and a sidewalk on the edge. So there will be plenty of room. I think the biggest advantage to the bridge is we now have a turning lane for people who are turning left on Freeport Road and we won't have the backup like we have now. The new bridge is scheduled to open in November of 2015. The old bridge will be demolished in December of 2015 and the entire project will be completed by May of 2016. Uh, they'll do some finishing touches and landscapings and things like that. The new bridge, as we know, is located on the upper side of the old bridge. And all the, although the old bridge won't survive this time, the name Halton will live on with the new bridge. The Halton Bridge has served the community of Oakmont for the past 105 years. When the bridge was completed, people crossed the bridge on foot and in horse and buggy. Today the bridge is lined with automobiles, buses, and 18-wheelers. 100 years ago, the designers of the bridge could never imagine the type of vehicles and the volume of traffic would cross the bridge each day. The structure is a testament to the men who built the bridge. And by the way, Joseph Bonetto had an, a road named after him in Plum Borough, so <laughs> he's not forgotten. <laughs> farewell, good friend. We will soon bid farewell to an old friend, a symbol of our town since 1909. Solid and silent in all your glory, you served us well. You were the first part of countless journeys and a welcome sight after a long trek home. We thank you for 105 years of service to our town and know that the old bridge will live on in our memories. Thank you. Oh, and if someone should ask us where we're off and bound today, we will tell them building bridges and be off and on our way. Oh, and if someone should ask us where we're off and bound today, we will tell them building bridges and be off and on our way. We will tell them building 